Hello and welcome to the Embedded C Programming Design Patterns Training. My name is Martin Schroeder at SwedishEmbedded.com. And this video is going to be an introduction to the free training I'm going to be publishing here on YouTube every month. Uh, there is around 14 different modules that I'm going to be rolling out one at a time. And basically we're going to go over all of the most essential design patterns for C programming, for embedded firmware development. Now, if you don't want to wait for every new module, you can get all of this content right away, right now, in three main forms. So we have the book form uh, on Kindle, we have book and video form that's uh, delivered to you as a Udemy course. And the last one is book and video form, plus also a live weekly Q&A with me. So let's have a look at these options, basically. If the links don't work, you can search for the book title directly on Amazon. So this is a Kindle version. It contains all of the written content. Uh, the Udemy course contains the written content as resources here and also um, the video content and also additionally interactive quizzes where you can answer questions and you'll get uh, whether you answered right or wrong answer. So it's also very useful. Um, and you can find the course on Udemy if you also search for the embedded C programming design patterns. And lastly, um, all of this content is also available on the website directly as um, both the written content and video form. And uh, this is available as a subscription. So you click here, uh, join now, and uh, you fill out your details. You pick the student account, you click continue. And then you have uh, access to all of the trainings available um, under the training section. Plus, there is also Q&A. So until the next Q&A, we have five days, four hours. Uh, if you're registered, if you're logged in, you will have a link here to the Zoom call, which you can join every Wednesday at 19.00 Central European time. And also as a, as a student member, you have access to all of my other courses. And the Design Patterns course is here. And basically there is uh, all of the content here. So let's go over what is actually included in this course and uh, what you're going to learn. And subscribe to my channel uh, if you want to you know, wait until the next uh, pattern comes out here on YouTube. Just subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'll publish it in about a month. So let's get started. So we're going to start out by looking at the most essential design pattern in the C programming language, which is the object pattern. And you've probably heard this before about object-oriented design but uh, you've probably never seen it uh, described in the way that I'm going to describe it. So basically, we're going to make sure that all of our code is structured into objects and anything that is not structured into objects is done so for a good reason. So the object pattern is really essential. We're going to start with that pattern and uh, we're going to then build on that pattern to create all the other patterns. After the object pattern, we're going to look at the opaque pattern. Uh, this pattern is just like the object pattern, but we keep even the data definition of our data structure private. We're going to have to look at um, allocation techniques for uh, the opaque pattern, and especially how we do that in C. So in, in C++, you would use new or delete. In C, we have to be very careful with the um, memory allocation. So we need to have multiple different methods of allocating those opaque objects. Then we're going to look at the singleton pattern which enforces a single instance of a particular object. And just like a lot of these patterns, they enforce a certain expectation. So when you apply the pattern, you can be clear about the intent and the expectations of the structure of your code. And uh, if anybody then tries to go against this uh, intention, then it will become apparent because the pattern will, will prevent that. And the singleton pattern is specifically designed to make sure that you do not instantiate the same object in many different places. The factory pattern is used to create objects based on a parametric description. So a, dis a device tree is a very good uh, example of the factory pattern. So we use the factory pattern to simplify our application, to make sure that we can create objects in one place and, we don't, and that we don't need to uh, do the complicated creation procedure in many different places in our, in our code. Then we're going to look at the callback pattern. And this pattern is useful in every single instance where you need to create a callback from one place to another in your application. We're going to look at how we can do this cleanly, how we can do this without using any kind of generic pointers like void pointers. We're not going to use any of that. And we're going to also look at how we can pass our current context to this callback and so that we can get a, an object-oriented callback that can 
be delivered to specific instances of an object without having to pass a void pointer or anything like that. Then we're going to look at the inheritance pattern and how we handle this in C. So the C language by definition is very limited in terms of language features to, to implement inheritance, but we can implement inheritance conceptually by enclosing objects into each other. And we're going to look at how we do that in a controlled way. Then we're going to look at the virtual API pattern. And this pattern is really essential for any place where you want to have polymorphism in C. And there is a very specific way to implement this pattern so that you can keep it memory efficient and uh, object oriented as well. So that it's completely type safe so that you cannot end up with, you know, calling the wrong function at runtime. Everything is taken care of. So we're going to look at how we can do this properly in the virtual API pattern. Then we look at the bridge pattern. The bridge pattern is used in any place where you have two different hierarchies of objects. So you have two different hierarchies that evolve independently and you want to connect them together using a bridge. So we use a bridge for, for doing that. And the bridge pattern simplifies our application code considerably when we have objects that need to be controlled remotely. We will also cover the return value pattern. And uh, this is a pattern we use in every case where a function needs to return some status code that is non-trivial. So anytime you need to return some kind of status code, we use the return value pattern and we look at what return values we need to return when. So we're going to set up rules for the return values so that we can have clear expectations about our return values. So that whenever you have an if statement checking for a return value from a function, you can be very uh, clear about what to expect from that function. And that helps us to write uh, code that has less bugs because we can look at the code and we can, we can deduce the behavior of the code from the expectations that we have set up by applying the patterns. We're going to then look at concurrency and the remaining patterns are going to be related to concurrency. And uh, we will look first at the introduction to concurrency. So we'll see how different uh, priority levels uh, relate to each other between interrupts, uh, cooperative threads and actual normal threads. And then we're going to move into synchronization primitives that work at every level. So we're going to start with a spin lock pattern, which uh, interfaces to the hardware. So with a spin lock, we can uh, control uh, mutual exclusion between uh, multiple CPUs or between interrupt handlers and other code. So the spin lock pattern is the bottom at the bottom of the synchronization uh, hierarchy. And then uh, we're going to build on top of the spin lock pattern to implement other types of patterns. And in every case, I'm going to show you code, how to actually implement the spin lock, how it works, what it does. After the spin lock, we're going to look at the semaphore pattern, which is used for signaling from an interrupt handler to uh, another thread. So this is a pattern that interfaces interrupts to thread context. So we are one level up above hardware. Then after that, we're going to look at the mutex pattern, which is uh, exclusively used for threads. And um, we're going to look at how the mutex works, works, how it is implemented, what additional features the mutex has, how it prevents um, thread starvation. And uh, the mutex pattern is now another level up above the semaphore pattern. So the mutex pattern has no concept of interrupts. It's just dealing with threads. And after that, we're going to look at the conditional pattern, which provides us with, a, with an interface to signal multiple threads and wake up multiple threads um, when an event arrives. So we can use a conditional pattern to signal from an interrupt to multiple other threads and wake them up at the same time. Who is this training for? Well, first of all, it is for embedded software architects. And it doesn't really matter how much experience you have in embedded development. You're very likely uh, to see some clarifications in this material that will help you understand your existing code much better. This training is also for beginner programmers. If you're just starting out, you're learning a programming language like C, you're learning maybe another programming language. Remember that patterns are programming language agnostic. They don't really um, they don't really relate to a single programming language. They're more of a conceptual patterns of structuring code. So even if you're a beginner programmer, you'll have very um, valuable understanding of design patterns from the start. So you can start creating code that is easy to maintain and that you don't need to refactor later. 
And also, if you're an embedded manager, it's very important that your team understands patterns and applies them. And as an embedded manager, you can also create custom patterns for the team where you set up uh, a rule book of how to actually develop on the project that you're managing. And when you have certain rules, then you can have clear expectations. You can have, uh, you can, it becomes easy for developers to look at some code that they're reviewing and understand what the co code does and to be able to identify potential problems because they understand the, the conventions of uh, structuring the code so that they can deduce the expectations just by looking at the code which is also very valuable. So as an embedded manager, you will uh, learn some basic patterns from this training, and then you can build on those patterns to create other valuable patterns for your team. When to introduce these patterns into a project? So, okay, so you learned the patterns. Now, when should you introduce them to a project? I find that the best place to introduce design patterns into a project is when you're refactoring code. Let's say you have run into a lot of problems with your code. You have bugs that you cannot easily solve. You don't know what is co causing the bugs. Uh, you find that you don't clearly understand the code as a whole because it's so convoluted. It has so many shared uh, variables. It has so much um, code that is dependent on each other. And so that's the point where you will have the most value from design patterns from the perspective of the of the project itself. You can you have some code that uh, kind of works, so you can you have a starting point, and now you can start cleaning up the code and refactoring it, and that's where the design patterns come in because they give you the guidance on how to refactor your code. But it's also useful for new projects. If you're just starting out with a new project, then having a prior knowledge of design patterns is extremely useful because you can just start applying them right away. It can be a little hard though if you have no prior experience of actually using design patterns uh, to start applying them right away on, on new code because then you have two problems to solve. You have the writing the code, actually solving the, uh, the code problem, and then also applying the design pattern. So it's kind of like two things you need to uh, juggle at once, but it's doable as well. So even if you are starting a new project, then uh, just start applying the design patterns right away. And where are those patterns then most useful? So where should you use those patterns in your code base? And pat patterns are by definition, because they're called patterns, is, is something you apply uh, many, diff many times on, in many different places. And the more you apply them, the more valuable they become. So a pattern that you just use once is not as valuable as a pattern such as the return value pattern that you use everywhere every time you need to return some status. So by, by using patterns, you set up conventions which make it easy to look at the code and instantly understand what it's doing. So the more uh, places where you can apply a pattern, uh, the more valuable the pattern is. So by definition, the patterns should be generic um, ways of structuring code that you can apply in multiple places to clean up your whole architecture. Each section in this training is divided into multiple parts. So each section starts with a quick overview of the pattern, basically just a quick explanation what this pattern is all about. Then we look at some use cases for a particular pattern. So we list a few potential use cases and you can use this as a guidance to kind of identify new use cases. By no means is it an exhaustive list of, of use cases, but I give you some use cases for, for every single pattern that we discuss. Then we look at the benefits of the pattern and compared to other patterns. So why would we use this pattern instead of something else? Then we look at some drawbacks of a particular pattern compared to other patterns. So why would you not want to use this pattern? Then we look at the actual implementation. And here I go into the code. I show you uh, details. I show you examples. There are a few examples for some of the design patterns that are, uh, that are actually available as part of the Switch Embedded Platform SDK. Uh, for some patterns, it doesn't really make sense to give uh, compilable examples because they're so simple. They're just explainable directly in the, in the slides. Um, but uh, the implementation usually gives you um, some source code and an explanation of, uh, of what the code is doing and why it's doing, why it's the right way to implement the pattern. After that, we'll look at best practices when implementing the pattern. So what you should uh, look out for and uh, repeat more. And then we look at common pitfalls, the things that you should avoid when you're implementing a particular pattern. 
Then we look at some alternative patterns uh, that relate to the current pattern, but usually not um, act as replacements for the current pattern. So each pattern is kind of designed for a particular task and for a particular use case. But there are alternatives that kind of relate to the same pattern and can be useful in other use cases which are related also to the current use case that the main pattern is designed for. And then every section has a quiz with questions where you can verify your understanding of the pattern. And if you need any additional help, I would suggest you join our Discord server. You can find the link at swedishembedded.com forward slash community. You can ask questions on the Discord server. You can post your uh, projects. You can post code. You can post links to your Git repositories. Basically, it's a discussion board. And just feel free to uh, hang out there and uh, discuss things. If you have any other questions that you don't want to ask on the Discord server, you can email me directly at martin.schroeder at swedishembedded.com. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you want to become a member, then there, there is a membership option at swedishembedded.com. So if you just go to the website and uh, click the join button at the, at the top. The membership also includes uh, weekly calls where we can discuss anything. So basically, you just join a weekly call. It's a group call. And uh, you can ask any questions related to embedded systems, not just design patterns, but just anything related to embedded firmware development, to Zephyr, to CI setup, to simulation using Renode, anything you can think of that's related to embedded systems, you can just join and ask and get, get, a, get an answer right away. So it's usually a very valuable uh, place to, um, uh, to join those calls. And you get that as part of the membership uh, membership account that you can get at swishembedded.com. And you also get access to all of the other trainings that are available on the website. So it's um, something to check out as well. So that's it for this quick introduction. Now let's jump right into the first design pattern, and I'll see you there. Bye for now.